So we all know Eric and your likes and dislikes of, of uh, different foods. No strawberries or bratwurst tonight, I promise. Um, can, can the other Eric, Eric Lifkowski and, and Jessica, could you please just share what your companies do just so that for anybody who's not familiar, we have some context. You wanna start? Yeah, so Tempest is in the business of trying to uh, usher in precision medicine and make it, um, make it real and tangible by collecting the data that would be necessary as a precursor uh, to all the great technologies that follow. So in our case, we structure clinical and molecular data, combine them at scale um, for about, I think we have about 25%, we started in cancer, we have about 25% of all cancer patients in the US, maybe 30% inside Tempest, mm -hmm. and we try to clean up all that phenotypic and therapeutic data, combine it with molecular data, and, and look for patterns that are therapeutically relevant, that can help pharma make better drugs, help doctors make better decisions, help payers pay for the right stuff, and all the downstream things to follow. Okay, and Jessica? So uh, my name is Jess Mega. I'm a cardiologist and had the pleasure of partnering with Eric for many years. I was working at Harvard Medical School and about four years ago left and joined a group at Google X that was thinking about the applications of technology and how do you apply that to life science and healthcare. We became the fastest growing part of Google and now are a separate bet under Alphabet. So we are focused on taking the world's health information and making it useful. Uh, we have projects that are in the life science space, projects that are thinking about evidence generation and clinical trials, and then also how do you apply that to the care setting. Uh, we're very fortunate, Eric's also on our, our advisory board, and so one of our key philosophies is making sure we bring together the best and brightest in science and medicine along with the technologists that you would find at a place like Google. And Eric, you advise Tempest as well. They yeah, both these so pretty good companies. This is yeah. very incestuous here. <laughs> um, okay, so obviously the three of you are, are, are bullish on the use of technology and, and, and data-driven medicine um, overall. Can you just kind of give your, your quick pitch on why you're bullish and what you think is, is the most promising um, change to, to come that it will enable? Whoever wants to start. You can't just toot your own horn. Yeah, um, so I think, I mean, what's interesting about the, the healthcare space in, in particular is, is that it's, it's been late to adopt some of the technologies that have found their way uh, into other areas. And you, we, we now, and for lots of good reasons, but some of the underlying technology paradigm shifts that m made that so have now reversed themselves. So you can essentially collect data at scale, at low cost. You can use tools like natural language processing and optical character recognition to structure that data. Um, there's been a revolution in imaging and the ability to, to kind of look at um, anatomic pathology slides and radiology scans and make sense of that. There's certainly been a revolution in generating molecular data at low cost. And so all of a sudden, you can build these very large, clean, structured data sets that were almost impossible to build a decade ago. And so we think starting in cancer, but we've also extended into diabetes and depression and other areas, we think there's gonna be this kind of revolution of kind of augmented intelligence, not necessarily artificial intelligence, but a generation of physicians that are relying on technology systems that are you know, kind of a, um, at arm's length and using that to make real-time clinical decisions and kind of start to put patients on their own end of one therapeutic path. And that likely will be in place for some horizon of time and then eventually maybe there will be true artificial intelligence mm -hmm. in the space. But I think the, the, the backdrop is, is, is remarkable, and I think the pace at which you now are seeing um, these kind of big data, machine learning, AI tools penetrating healthcare is like it's on a big giant slope up, and so I'm, I'm bullish on, on what that means over the, certainly the next five or 10 years. So in addition to that, the, an area that has absolutely caught my attention is what it really means to understand health in the context of medicine. And so I, I do still see pa patients at Stanford, and so when I see the patients, I'm able to understand their heart rate, their blood pressure, even the pressures inside their heart. But we know that people spend a minimum amount of their time with a doctor in the healthcare system, and much of health is happening every single minute and every single day. And so there's this idea of what is comprehensive health, and I think it's the blurring of what we think of as traditionally medical in addition to what kind of sleep patterns we heard Eric talk about, diet, stress, all of these other elements that are both inside and outside of the four walls of a hospital. And, and to me, that is where healthcare is going. Eric, anything to add? 
Well, I think the ability to take this uh, multimodal, multidimensional data and pull that together. So like what Eric is doing at Tempest, bringing in the scans and the slides and all the electronic records and um, every aspect you can think of, the genomic sequencing of the tumor, of the, the native DNA, to be able to fashion uh, the treatment and to be able to use a digital infrastructure of finding nearest neighbors, finding the, the, the person, the twin, that's most like the, the patient of interest, to be able to come up with best therapies. We're gonna see that not just in cancer, but across the board. And I think that's really an important step forward. Uh, I think uh, this is, again, the kind of next chapter. Right now, it's narrow, mm -hmm. a, a unimodal story, but it's gonna blossom pretty quickly. Well, we, we've seen tech companies for years try to uh, make big moves in, in healthcare and to radically change um, healthcare, uh, a lot of it with just digitization. Um, what, what do you see? I mean, is, is it clearly the technology is different and some of the things that you mentioned are, are possible now that weren't before? But is there a difference also in the approach that makes it more likely to succeed? I, I think there's a real understanding of what does it culturally mean to operate in life science and healthcare? And what does it mean to make medical grade decisions? So you need to understand the regulatory landscape, uh, the payer landscape, what patients are really interested in, and making sure those groups are partnering with the latest technology. And we're, the last panel was talking about AI. There are many different tools, many of them that are open source. The more important thing is what's the problem we're solving. So. Uh, right now we have a project with diabetic retinopathy. The algorithm is amazing, but that is one piece of an end-to-end -end solution that is truly going to change the trajectory of diabetic retinopathy. So I think understanding that this is a long life cycle in order to get these products out there is something that you see across the board. I think a, bit, <clears throat> a big part of this is, is certainly timing. I mean, you know, Google five years before Google was Lycos and AltaVista, and Five years later, it was Ask.com, and Facebook five years before it was MySpace. And so part of it is just timing, right? You have to get these things right. But you also need all the underlying technologies that make it uh, possible. And, and those technologies just didn't exist until this moment. And so if you look at some of the, what would be called historic failures of big tech companies entering the space, the, the task was Herculean and, and impossible to achieve. You couldn't structure data at low cost. There, there weren't things like AWS and Google's version of AWS. Um, there weren't, you know, artificial intelligence was nascent in terms of image recognition capabilities, and, and, and sequencing was a million dollars a patient, not a thousand dollars a patient. So, you, you, you know, these technologies just didn't exist. They, they now exist, and so I think you're going to see a whole other generation of these same tech companies, the, the biggest and best tech companies, entering the space, who now will likely have unparalleled success. Uh, not by virtue of the fact that something changed at those companies, but the underlying backdrop changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's promising, I think, for everybody in the field. Yeah, I, I think the reason why for decades, many decades, there was AI, but now that it's come alive, uh, Eric touched on not just the fact that there was cloud computing and graphic processing units, GPUs, but the biggest thing is the subtype of AI deep learning. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, last week, the Turing Award given to Jeffrey Hinton and John, Jan LeCun and Yashio Bengio because this had such a fundamental change. The, of all the different types of AI, we couldn't have dealt with these massive data sets. Mm -hmm. And that's given us a whole new light to take care of images that are so critical in medicine, uh, uh, certainly voice, which is going to change the face of things like the, key the keyboard liberation or mental health. And, other, uh, and then, of course, tech. So when you have these features that can be distinguished through a deep learning uh, neural net, that changes everything. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the security and privacy side. And I know the three of you all have um, opinions on this and, and, and probably somewhat different approaches. Um, Eric, maybe we can start with you. Um, in, in an ideal world, how do companies go about making sure that privacy and security are, are first and foremost top of mind when they're developing these technologies. And, and I know you've, you've talked and written about how patients, consumers, should own their data. What does that world look like? And is that the only solution? I think ultimately is the only solution that people have to own their data. 
because what we're seeing now, of course, is uh, the, the worst case scenario where data is, is uh, sold, uh, it's a stolen, hacked, cyber thievery is rampant, and our medical data is at least 5x the worth on the dark web as our personal financial data. So uh, we're, we have a situation now which is uh, not acceptable, and if you talk to cyber gurus, uh, they will say you got to get it down to units of one or the smallest possible units, whereas, of course, it sits on massive servers that have indeed been hacked, and so many health systems have been held hostage uh, for their data. So that requires a, a fundamental change. We've seen it in other countries, like in Estonia and other, in Switzerland, and other countries are adopting this ownership model mm -hmm. where people can share parts of their data with certain, uh, 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 whether they be physicians or medical research projects or that sort of thing. Eventually we will go there because this will have to be considered a civil right, uh, uh, that it's your data, you paid for it, and all the other things that it could change your life. But in the era of AI, it's the inputs. Mm -hmm. If you don't have all this data, which is in the US, it's all over the place from mm -hmm. various uh, doctors and encounters throughout one's life, then you, you have a, a compromised input and you can only expect so much as an output. So that's why we have to move to a different uh, uh, method and we're, we're a long ways from that today. So, okay, Alphabet, Google, <laughs> slightly different model in how data has been utilized and, and stored than, than this vision that you're painting. So what is Verily's vision of, of data ownership, privacy and security? Yeah, I think two key issues. One is when you're dealing with health data or life science data, I'll use the example of devices. Uh, if you think about a pacemaker or an ICD or a continuous glucose monitor that is giving medically great information to a person who may change their dose of insulin, for example, we have to be 100% sure that this is actually their data. So again, I think understanding cybersecurity in this age is critical, and you're seeing groups uh, across the board championing that. I think on the Ownership, I would even say, and take it one step further, how do you actually give value back to people? So not just surfacing a lot of medical data, but saying this is what it means for you. Here is your continuous glucose data. You, uh, you uh, ate a certain food, and here's how you can make healthy choices. I think the more we think about not only the data but value, uh, that's, that's a, a mission that we've had from the beginning. And, and would you say, um, I mean, are, are you taking steps in that direction early on to make sure that that data is owned and stored with people themselves? So if you look at our baseline initiative that we started several years ago in conjunction with Duke, Stanford, and the American Heart Association, uh, as well as volunteers who sit on the committees, the idea was how can you ethically return information to people? And so that has been a philosophy that is something that underscores the work that we do. And just real quick, explain the baseline project. Uh, so the baseline study, it goes back to the very first thing that I talked about is what does comprehensive health look like? And so it is a very deep dive into the genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, the microbiome. Uh, it looks at patient reported outcomes, sleep data, study device data, in conjunction to what we think about as traditional data, echocardiograms, stress echoes. What we were able to do with this group of initial volunteers is start to understand, again, health in the context of the hospital, but also outside. Because I think many people think they're healthy until they have a disease, but in many cases, there's a much more subtle transition. Mm -hmm. And with the capabilities that we've been able to build over the years, we've now been able to partner with the AHA and launch a Research Goes Red campaign to make sure that we're including women in research as well. So you'll start to see groups expanding their research platform to make sure there is inclusion so that the data that we have is, is truly generalizable. And I definitely want to get back to that point, but your, your take on, uh, on data privacy and who should own, who should uh, well, own it. Well, I mean, obviously the patient should own the data, but as they do, I mean, my take on it in general. It's not that obvious. I mean, well, we don't own most of our data that's out there. I mean, the, the, I think the Supreme Court's weighed in, but the, the bigger issue, I think, is coming from uh, kind of the tech world, um, we actually, this is one of the few areas where I think the federal government's done a decent job at, in terms of defining uh, PHI, and there, there are laws like HIPAA, there are a litany of requirements in terms of what you can do with identified data as opposed to de-identified data, none of which, by the way, exists in the non-health world. We have breaches all the time uh, in e-commerce of 
millions of patients worth of credit card data, um, and if you had that same breach as a healthcare company, it would be radically different. So I agree we have a long way to go, but in general, I think this is an area where um, we, we've done better than we have in some other areas. I, and I think the, the, the real challenge is um, the, one of the biggest problems you have as a patient in terms of ownership of your data is what do you do with the data? First of all, it's a huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. And second of all, it's largely unstructured. And um, what, you end up, what ends up happening is you as a patient, even when you get your hands on your data, you're often emailing it to a physician and they have no ability to import it and back into their EHR, EMR system. So there's just no interoperability or transferability of this data. And so I think even though a patient should own their data and they certainly have a right to it, and even though providers should be able to house that data seamlessly, Probably the bigger challenge we all have to tackle is the underlying infrastructure that allows us to move around this kind of rich clinical data seamlessly across providers, across physicians, all of which is entirely today broken and siloed, but again, is likely to be fixed by these really massive technology currents that are just there. So mm -hmm. with NLP and OCR and all these great technologies, we will likely be in a place in a very short number of years where this data can be structured on the back end and moved between an Epic or a Cerner or an Allscripts or an OncoEMR or pick your provider. And that I think is gonna be one of the biggest, you know, you know, unlocking of patients being able to port their data from one doctor to another. Um, it's interesting you mentioned uh, the, the model of Estonia. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how China is approaching this. I know you advise a company there as well it seems like a radically different approach. So can you explain how the government there is dealing with this? Well, it actually does have the same or problem as we do here where each hospital has got their own uh, pretty much uh, customized information system. So when you go from one city to another, that data is not really transferable. But the difference there is as it's called the Saudi Arabia of medical data because in that one hospital, they have so many large numbers of patients and all their data. And because each citizen has uh, all their data through the government, it's actually a pretty good setup for making these remarkable annotated data sets. So that's how to come there so much further ahead in some of the things that we want to do here. Okay. One of the things that really holds us back is getting medical data sets at scale across these different types of, of uh, substrate um, is really difficult and they are way ahead in that regard. So on the one hand, for patient care, it's not, it, it's segmented, uh, it's got s s serious problems with, with interoperability like we have here, perhaps even worse, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, for any given health system hospital, it's got a big advantage. Okay, interesting. Um, I wanna go to you guys for questions in, in just a minute, but just to, to get back to the topic you raised on um, the, the diversity of data sets and how important that is, um, what are, are both of your companies doing to make sure, I mean, you're collecting massive amounts, you're, you've got the baseline project and other projects that Verily's um, embarked on. What are you doing to make sure that the data that you're collecting is representative? Algorithms are not inherently biased, but people who develop them can be, and the data sets sure can be. So maybe you can start, Jess. Yeah, I, I think it's critical to think about generalizability and for years having spent time thinking about how do you design a clinical trial where the result ends up reflecting the general population, I think it's even more important as we think about algorithms, whether we're training to look at diabetic retinopathy that I mentioned earlier, if we're looking at clinical outcomes, if we're looking at things like the microbiome, we have to make sure that we do, do a very dedicated job of outreach. And so the example that I used uh, is something that we have launched in conjunction with the American Heart Association and Nancy Brown around research goes red for women. And it's not that there haven't been many efforts, but I think many times people still underestimate that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for women. And so being very dedicated and deliberate around these choices is something that we all have to do. Are you also, are you, keep, are you uh, being very deliberate about making sure that different ethnicities and races are represented in that? Yeah, you know, it's such a good question. What we, we, so the, the short answer is yes. And the reason we can do it now, in contrast to think about clinical studies or even clinical care a few years ago, 
you could only see what's under the lamppost that you're looking. Mm -hmm. But now we can start to understand if you want to match the census or if you want to augment certain populations, you can actually spend more time because you can look at that data in real time. And that's one of the biggest differences I'm seeing. I used to remember the days where we'd get the PDFs. So what we would get is standard operations reports, both for the hospital and on the clinical research side. And we would take the PDF and we would circle with a red pen. And it was almost too late to be actionable. But now that we can see some of these observations in more real time, we have a moment to make sure that representation is truly there. Mm -hmm. So it's an example that Eric was giving of different types of technology that is allowing us to do our jobs better. Mm -hmm. our, our solution is just simply scale. You know, we have about, in cancer, we have something like you know, almost 5,000 oncologists on our platform. Mm -hmm. We had like, I think, seven new oncologists a day. And so we just have so, so much data that we were, I was having a conversation this morning. Somebody wanted to look at triple negative breast cancer patients that are African American, and um, they, they had a population of like 60 or 100. And I said, We can give you 1,000 in the 606 zip code if you want. And that's just the nature of the number of patients that we now see is that we just have a large enough data set that it just by its very nature is diverse. We also are fortunate that we work with over 50 of the 70 NCI cancer centers and a whole bunch of community practices, and so we're fairly geographically um, agnostic, so that helps. Okay, questions from the audience. Raise your hand, please, if you would like to ask. We've got one up here. There's a microphone coming to you. Thank you. Um, I'm Pete Onimus. I'm from Switzerland, and I'm from uh, Dakadu. We score people's health in uh, real time and we are active in 20 different countries. So for the panel, don't you think with healthcare we should do like we did with the GSM standard? So basically, as Eric know in Switzerland, for instance, there's a startup called the Health Bank where you can store your data and you get paid if any pharmaceutical uses your data. But I don't think it solves the fundamental problem of data security and privacy because if we don't have a standard, you know, the industry would not grow. And I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, this is my fifth company I'm building, and I think governments have been very, very slow in reacting in this space. And if you look at GSM, you can use your phone in China, you can use it in North Korea, you can use it in America, and why wouldn't we do the same in healthcare? At the end, all governments got together and agreed on a standard. And I think this multi, multi, multi trillion dollar opportunity called health needs a standard and that needs to be driven by governments and then entrepreneurs and CEOs like myself, we will then create the business opportunity around it. I, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, Estonia has, I think, the best model. Uh, they have, every citizen of Estonia has their data on a blockchain platform. They can share as they need to, and the government is you know, fully supportive of it. It works, there's been a great New Yorker piece about that last year. Uh, that's a, a model that can be simulated. Um, so I think if, if we can get major countries to come together that this is the right way to move forward. The, the beauty about that is we can learn from all people in the species about health and various conditions. And so what is being done at Tempest in, in a narrow area of cancer in this country, this could go wor worldwide. But we have to get countries to cooperate and agree on what is the right platform. And, but it's all doable. We have the technology, whether it's through private cloud or blockchain or some type of hybrid, it can be done. Sounds super easy. <laughs> well, getting governments to work together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, question back here. Sure. sure. Uh, one, one quick comment and then a question. Uh, there was a, a study done at Stanford by some economists looking at three scenarios. Uh, corporations own data, governments regulate data, individuals own data. And th if you saw that, the highest economic technological growth was in the third, so something to look at if you haven't read it. Uh, my question is related to training data sets. So who should then set the standards for source of truth if we're gonna look for AI to give us diagnoses or better information around healthcare going forward? I'm happy to, to dive in. I'm sure the other panelists have thoughts. The uh, it's such a good point about what are the standards in terms of not only the training set, but the validation. And it has already come up not only in the United States, but what does it mean if you're thinking about healthcare globally? Uh, one group that has been thinking about it is certainly through the FDA, and they have also started a pre-certification program, which a number 
uh, groups that have rallied around to say what are going to be the standards. Um, I think all of us should pay attention to that, and I think the comment that we had before, thinking not only in the U.S. but internationally, is critical. Um, the other thing is how do we actually regulate algorithms that make it better over time? And that's going to be a different paradigm than lockdown algorithms. But I, I actually do want to commend the FDA for, for really trying to take a proactive stance here in an area that is evolving uh, tremendously rapidly. I think we had another question up front here. Hi, I'm Silvana Sinha. I run a healthcare company in Bangladesh, and we actually have the first molecular cancer diagnostics lab in the country. And I just want to push a little further. Um, I mean, Asia has most of the global population living in it. Um, and I know from researchers at places like Dana-Farber that a lot, of the, a lot of the data on cancer is really based on Caucasian populations. So what are you guys doing to really ensure? I mean, I think the United States is, an, is amazingly placed as the thought leader when it comes to science and data. But with that opportunity comes responsibility. And so how do you think about the sharing of data internationally to really make sure that the findings are relevant to the global populations? Well, the first thing I'd say just really quickly is, um, and we, when we designed our lab, we'll sequence about 130,000 samples this year and about 300,000 next year. So we're a very large clinical sequencer. When we designed our lab, we decided early on to do germline sequencing and somatic for that very reason, because we didn't want to rely on these cosmic-oriented data sets, largely that were white Caucasian males, that were the reference set of what the human genome was. We wanted to actually be able to call mutations based upon your true germline state, which is variable not just the United States, but worldwide. So I think, and, and again, that was um, a choice we were lucky to be able to make because we began sequencing in 2016 when sequencing was very cheap. And if you were sequencing in 2010, you couldn't make that choice because the cost would be prohibitive. So I think you're going to start to see, as technologies become more pervasive, some of those problems of small, isolated data sets that had enormous bias will just go away with scale. Right. But it is a real issue. I, I would just say, you know, we are at Scripps Research, we're leading a big part of the All of Us Precision Medicine Initiative of a million Americans, and about half are now underrepresented minorities of the first 160, 170,000. All that data, when this million person cohort, and for years and years to come, with the genome sequences and sensor and microbiome and whatever is done, will be open access for the research uh, community globally. So that's the intent, and it's moving, you know, pretty well. Yeah, and one piece I, I would add on top of that is also making sure that the products work globally. And so uh, going back to the diabetic retinopathy example, one of the, the early stages of development is based in India because the idea of scaling tools where ophthalmologists and optometrists are particularly rare and there's an unmet clinical need, we, we certainly shouldn't be myopic and, and miss that. So thank you for bringing that up. All right, well, Eric, Jessica, and Eric, thank you, all three of you, very much for being with us.